Hey there, Arconiacs. It's another explosive episode. The season gets better and better as we go along. I want to do a very quick review and then get into decoding the episode because so much happened and there was a lot to decode. We open up with another voiceover from Loretta where it's confirmed that Dickie is her son. We learned that some creepy New York director used her dream of Broadway to have her way with her and she thought it was best to give up her son for a couple that could not conceive a child of their own. It was a strong plot point throughout the whole entire episode. The one thing that surprised me the most about this episode is that Dickie did not know, or up until this point does not know, that Loretta is his mother. I'm no manager, but going from an A-list actor, or at least an actor who's known all over the world, to managing, frankly, a woman who has no notable credits to her name and is set to start in an Oliver Putnam production, it seems off. Maybe he does know, and maybe he's just playing dumb, but I don't think he does. We also get the return of Detective Williams, who proclaims that Greg did not kill Ben. Ben was poisoned at the Gooseberry Theater, and it was covered up. Realizing that his show is doomed until he finds the killer, Oliver is back, and so is the only murders team. So while Mabel is following a lead with Howard, the olds try and listen to Detective Williams' questioning of the cast, and we get some very funny comedic moments from both sides. Donna and Cliff lament to Oliver that he invited the critic Maxine to the show. They state that critics never get access to a sits probe, and for a good reason. Loretta gets wind that Mabel is thinking that Dickie is guilty of Ben's murder, and at first tries to throw Mabel off, she later has a talk with Dickie, who explains some of his pain and the fact that he had an argument with Ben just before he died, leading her to think that he killed Ben. This is why she gave a false confession to the police, and I think she will be out before the end of the next episode. We also get the full version of the Pickwick Triplet song that was beautiful. Um, Steve voice, his inflections, and everything really sell the story. And the transitions to two and three frames during the song to show multiple perspectives at the same time. Chef's kiss. I love it. The song also tells us that in the end, the constable does not think that any of the triplets have done it. And that he needs to look for someone else that could possibly have had a motive and then hit it. Which makes sense. Throughout this episode, and especially at this point, towards the end, Meryl's eyes show so much pain without saying a word. I love it. She's just an amazing actress. Now, I'm also going back a bit, but I would be remiss if I failed to give the full version of Creatures of the Night its due respect. I thought this was also a very great song, and Jonathan's voice really carried it. I'm hoping that they are part of the Season 3 soundtrack. Like, if we get a Death Rattle Dazzle soundtrack, and it's only got the three songs on it, four songs on it, I don't care. I'm down for it. I'll buy it. Take my money. Donna and Loretta have an interesting conversation in the bathroom, and Oliver tells Loretta later that he trusts her, and more importantly, that he loves her. This was such a sweet and endearing moment in the series. Um, like the emotions that they are pulling out of these characters, seemingly out of nowhere, it's it makes for great TV, and it's a great story. But just as Loretta goes on stage. She thinks that the police are closing in on Dickie as the culprit, and out of fear, she exclaims that she did it. She's the one that killed Ben. She gives a flimsy excuse. She's arrested for it, and from the stress of the whole situation, Howard exclaiming to his lover to stop and not to do it, he has a heart attack and collapses. This was um, a very strong episode. It's going to take two seconds for the police, though, to figure out that Loretta has no idea how Ben actually died. It's stupid, but I understand where she was coming from and why she did what she did. But a lot's going on. So much happened. Let's do some decoding. First, as Loretta gives her monologue at the beginning about giving up her son, she states that the adoptive parents, who we are assuming 
are the Glenroys conceived a child of their own. Also sending a picture. Loretta states that you have a younger brother, not brothers, making the twin or triplet idea confirmed to be false, at least in the sense of actual twins or triplets. Also, Dickie seems to not know that Loretta is his mother. Maybe he can sense her big mom energy and feels open talking to her about things that one would think was very personal to him that he wouldn't just go around talking to one of his clients willy-nilly. I kind of very beautiful that Loretta found it as a sign that Dickie would be in New York and that his brother would be doing Broadway. It's uh, all a sign for her to go see him and to try and make up for lost times. I think it's very sweet. But I do truly wonder, because this was over 50 years ago, why Dickie never asked his adoptive parents who his real mother or father was. She never attempted to reach out. It's, it's really hard situation. I understand. I would never pretend to understand. Um, everyone can be different and everyone is different. I understand Dickie would have reservations on looking up who his real uh, parents were, or maybe the Glenroys told, told him bad things about her. Who knows? From the things Dickie said, it kind of feels like as if he might have known but just didn't bring it up to her out of respect or fear. Who knows? It's a tricky situation, and I just wonder if it's possible that he does know. Though, from the way the show is portraying it, it, portraying it, it does not seem as if he does. Howard tells Mabel he is a puzzle solver, and humorously, he starts to try and explain it with the word puzzle, but he can only derive the word up from it. It's likely nothing, but there are actually seven words you can derive from the word puzzle. Most of them, I could not find any even possible small inkling of what it could ever be tied to the series. But a couple, two words, Lou, L-E-U, it's a possible uh, reference to leukoctosis. I may have pronounced that wrong. It means a high white blood cell count. It's also a short for leukemia. Also, Z-U-Z, I believe it's pronounced Zuz, means move. It was originally about money and how it must move from person to person. So this whole white blood cell thing could do something about blood's been test. Very, very big stretch. Or the moving money could do something about the insurance or a possible scheme of the play itself. Very big stretches, but I wanted to put that in there. Also, the character of Kimber um, is approached by Detective Williams and said to have played Roxy in Chicago, which is a very famous play. It is a story about a woman named Roxy Hart, who is a murderer. I will also add that the actress who plays Kimber, if you're not familiar with her, Ashley Park, she has done quite a bit of Broadway and worked with a lot of other organizations that help bring the performing arts to those who can't access it. She was also in a rom-com called Joyride. If you like the kind of raunchy uh, rom-coms, I think you might enjoy it. But if you like those kind of things, I would suggest give it a watch. We also learn that Greg definitely had nothing to do with Ben's demise, that he was not there when it happened. Ben was poisoned before walking on stage and that it was covered up. This is really big, though I'm not a fan of how little info they gave about it. I understand that the police would not share so much information about an open investigation, but this makes it really hard to figure out what's going on. But I will tell you exactly what I think happened. Covering it up would be an arrestable offense, I would believe, but I think the context of this is going to make what happened seems uh, a lot more plausible. I believe that it was Dickie who covered it up unknowingly. I believe Dickie only wanted to cover up the fact that he had the leading man drugs in his system, not realizing that someone possibly tried to kill him. So it then looks like Dickie tried to cover up the murder, but he was just trying to do something 
he's trying to do what he always does for his brother, cover up his fuck-ups. I still don't think someone tried to kill Ben the first time on stage. That's my personal idea. I don't think that it was a setup, uh, but I want to keep my choices open, and I will go over them later. We also learned that the trio has some interrogations on tape. We know that they don't have the questioning from Ty or Bobo on tape. Also, Charles and Oliver themselves should have been questioned. They were both present, and it was well known that Charles and Ben did not get along. Joy was also there in his dressing room. Donna and Cliff were there. I wonder if they were questioned. It, it didn't seem as if they were all being questioned. It seemed as if it was just the cast members, but it might have just been uh, because of time. Either way, I don't think anything will actually come from the recordings. Maybe the origin of the cookies. I'm still guessing that it's Kimber or something out of left field. Tarbert will have some old footage on the memory card that he didn't delete that's helpful for the trio for some reason and it's going to paint him in a bad light i don't know but overall i don't think anything super crazy is going to come from the footage we also get donna and loretta in the restroom where surprisingly donna is sick but comes out saying that it's nerves but then we get the shot of her with her hands behind her head as if she's grabbing something now i know it's a bold assumption but I'm thinking what she did here was adjust her wig and her being sick is because of the fact that she has cancer and she was vomiting from the radiation treatment. There wasn't much in the past episodes for us to think that this might be an option, but to me, it's the only thing that makes sense. But I do believe while she's having this conversation with Loretta, this is what she's referencing when she says that she wouldn't have hung on if it wasn't for Cliff. I don't think she's just talking about with theater, but also in life. She doesn't think that she would even hang on if she didn't have a reason to, and she finds that reason in her son. It's possible she could have seen Death Rattle as a bomb waiting to explode and attempted to make Ben sick or even to kill him so the show didn't go on but she seems to really want to support her son. So I don't think that this is it. I don't think that Donna is a fraud at all. I think that she doesn't want to work any longer at all because she's physically sick and she's chugging along just to support her son's dream. And money is tight. The only reason keeps, she keeps bringing it up is because of the medical bills. Though, once we do see Charles' dressing room, it is nice. It looks really fucking nice. And Ben's dressing room looks like trash. So Ben wasn't talking out of his butt when he was saying that his dressing room was really bad for no reason. And it kind of leads to the idea that they might have been doing something trying to make it a flop. But I think that it might just be a red herring. I'm hoping that it was and that Donna isn't doing this because she has cancer and in a need to make money. So she's trying to get a sale out of nothing. She's trying to pull the producers. I will also say that there does seem like there's something fishy going on with Maxine and that she could possibly be in on it if there is what we will call a pulling of producers going on. She keeps talking about how it is such a flop. No, um, no matter what, it seems as if she wanted to pan this play. She could have been in it with Donna to ensure the play would fail. But it seems like too many people are involved in it for it to be true. Maybe Maxine did it herself to ensure people saw peak Maxine. You know, some of her best writing. It all seems like a stretch. I know, but I had to throw it out there. What I think is the biggest tell in the story Dicky states that he had a fight with Ben before he went on stage. I think that I may have figured out what this fight was about, and it all starts because of those weird noises Howard heard from Katie's office when he realizes that it was a shredder, and he begins looking through the shreds. Now in the larger document, we see it's upside down, but if you turn it around, there are any shreds put together but each sliver of sheet 
is about two letters wide. And I say about because sometimes there's a little bit more, a little bit less, and there is some handwriting on here also. On the lower left of this sheet, you can see a lowercase o, a capital B, and a lowercase r. Now this leads me to believe that this document says Cobro, but why would a document at the Gooseberry Theater being shredded say Cobro? I suggest that Dickie brought it and he was asking his brother Ben to be credited at least as a partial originator of Cobro. And this is why Ben told Dickie, you're dead to me and shreds it. They had a fight. He's a prick. And he didn't want to share any of it, even if he didn't earn it. There is a second document, or maybe it's part of the same one. We can see a few words that are put together and they're all on the right side of the page. We can see the words or phrases until and society informing composer. However, write to and wear it. There are some other partial words and we could make educated guesses on that, but I'd rather just focus on trying to make some guesses on the words that we can fully see. The phrase until and sounds like some kind of condition or a requirement. This leads me to think that it could be the same document that says the word Cobro and it was some stipulations Dickie made about the Cobro brand. Lower on the document is the words right to. This could be someone's entitlement or legal claim and that would make sense if this was a document drafted by Dickey trying to get some of the rights to Cobro. There is also the word composer, which usually suggests a connection to music or musicals, but Death Rattle was not dazzling at that time, so it had to be something else. This is a very big stretch, but it could do with composing the Cobro theme song. I don't know if there's even a Cobro theme song, but maybe Dickie wrote something to that effect when he was young too. And this whole thing was taken by his brother, that prick, Ben. We also see the word society. It usually refers to some kind of organization. My assumption that this is in reference to the people that call themselves Cobros. So with no reason to think this is a thing whatsoever, I'm going to say that this is indeed a reference to the fandom, the Cobro Society. There are many stretches here. There are so many stretches here. You can call me Christina Ricci. The other words or partial words I feel are way too generic that I'm not even going to attempt to figure it out and say something that's so wildly off base that you'll laugh at me later. No, I don't want you to laugh at me. Altogether, a full encompassing sort of story of what's going on. I think Donna is sick and she's only doing the show to appease her son. She's in no way guilty. Her little conversation with Loretta makes her too obvious of a choice. Ben argues with Dickie over the rights of Cobro. Ben has an argument with Loretta. She calls him a pig. Charles sees it and punches Ben. At this time, Camber stops by Ben's dressing room with the cookies and hopes Ben will endorse her anti-aging serum. No one is there and she leaves them. Toblerone sees the aftermath of the fight and Ben takes his camera from him and heads to his dressing room. Just before this or just after that, Ben would call Joy to fix his makeup or fix his face, I should say, before the show. As Joy leaves, Ben notices the cookies and eats them, calling himself a fat ass and writes oink oink on the mirror. Something in the cookies, Kimber put, unknowingly makes him sick. And that is why he collapses on stage. I will admit there is a possibility that there was rat poison in him, but I do think that that is bold. I don't want to cross that bridge until we hear for a fact that rat poison is what was used. If, if we don't get that confirmation from Detective Williams, that poison was he was poisoned like purposefully for a fact, I'm not going to assume that. 
Dickie's last act to protect his brother is to hide what drugs was in his system, not realizing he was hiding a potential killer. This is again why police want to talk with Dickie and why he seems like a viable guilty party. After the after party, <laughs> Ben is pushed down the elevator shaft with the hanky, something Charles has collected from the cast. People who may have one that Charles has not collected are among the only possibilities of the culprit. And to me, those two people are Cliff and Tobert. Everyone else seems just way too obvious. Robert doesn't seem to have a good enough motivation to me. If he worked for Cinda, he's doing a really bad job. The trio is back with what appears to be the biggest podcast of their career. And they don't need Cinda. Tybert hasn't attempted to get his name on the credits or anything for helping with what information Mabel does have right now. He said that he wanted to make his own documentary about Ben, but he's not working too much on it. And I think that the footage that he has would technically belong to Dickie or Ben's parents. I don't like this guy, but I do think he's supposed to appear as a genuine person. And Cliff, he's the only one left tied closely enough to the play that would have a hanky that could be unaccounted for. And he hasn't said something super suspicious. Most characters have said something that sounds super, super sus that makes them sound like the killer. Like literally everyone has said something like this, but him and Cliff are the only ones that hasn't. The only other person with a, a credible amount of screen time is Maxine and that's cutting it close. I don't think she's had that much, but she's seen or mentioned enough in the story towards the beginning and the end that she is a possibility, but again, I don't think she would have a hanky. And three female killers in a row. Boo. Cliff. He's the only person left. Credible. Only credible person. I don't know. Oh, I'm really at a loss. I'm going to look at these documents some more, and maybe I can find something else. But tomorrow I will try and have an episode 9 preview about what I think is going to happen. Those are my thoughts on this episode. I know it was a lot to go over. I hope I didn't go too deep or didn't lose you there with some of these wild theories. But either way, let me know what you think is going on. And also, thank you, Donna. I don't want to say your last name, but thank you, Donna, for uh, writing in the comments. I couldn't find it, but let me know that you were the one who pointed out that Ben had a cutout of himself in the closet and that could be a metaphor for him being closeted. And I really had a lot of fun making that video and I could not have done it without you. I want to add that I very much still believe it is still a very big possibility. There was some sort of relationship going on between Cliff and Ben, but we will see. Um, again, thank you, Donna, so much. I'll go back and edit a thank you into that uh, last video and uh, one here. Overall, thank you guys very much for watching. My name is Dallas, and I'll catch you on the rooftop.